you go through time. I mean, that's the other thing if you're in a long marriage as we have been. You know, you could say well, if we've been in many marriages because mm. it hasn't been one yeah. thing over time. I mean, there, mm -hmm. and it has to be that way. Yeah, we've had seven or eight or nine different marriages. <laughs> yeah, right. <so. laughs> yeah. Even when we could sort of fool each other, ourselves about that, we can't do it with each other. So we challenge each other in a way to live out of that part of ourselves. That's very obviously very, you know, appealing to each of us and very, you know, challenging. And so our relationship keeps challenging us in that way. And, um, you know, it's, it's alive, it's exciting. If it were dead, then that would be... And then why would you stay married? You know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think that's really the kind of core of it. And I think it's funny because I think it's easier in this society. I wrote that's why I wrote the birth of pleasure. It's easier to talk about pain. It's easier to talk about sadness. It's easier to talk about loss. It's easier to talk about tragedy. And it is to talk about love, about pleasure, about just you know having fun with each other and liking to be with each other and sort of being intrigued by each other and like we're that kind of thing. So, you know, for example, I dedicated my novel to Jim and I said in the acknowledgments that I don't think I would have written a novel because I, Jim believed that I could write a novel long before I thought so. And, you know, Jim's book, Violence, in the opening, and he'll say that in his acknowledgement that he felt that I challenged him to write that book in his own voice. And that incredible opening of that book, I mean, just the sheer writing of the opening of that, you know, I know Jim is somebody who can do that. So if he, so you know, there. If if you really want to know why are we together after all these years, that's probably the answer to that. First of all, you know, if you really love somebody, that means you know them, because otherwise you don't love them. You love something else. So if you love somebody, you know them, and if you know them, you really know, and I think that's what part of love is, is that you want them to, you know, flourish. And so that's, in, if marriage does that, it's amazing you know, to feel you live with that kind of knowing of each other and being known and um, that desire to see one another be most fully, you know, sort of really themselves. And then that doesn't, that, is, that doesn't threaten the relationship. It's sort of ridiculous to think about that. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. The Radical Imagination is entering its seventh year of airing. We've had on some of the most talented and gifted scholars and authors, activists, artists, and creative people from around the world. But in terms of political, cultural, academic, and moral influence, there's been only one other husband-wife team that rivals the couple we have on the show today. That was Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. Carol and Jim Gilligan are our guests on the Radical Imagination today. Carol is an American feminist, ethicist, activist, and psychologist who's considered the originator of the ethics of care theory. Her landmark 1982 book, In a Different Voice, explored the stages of moral development of women and was described as the little book that started a revolution. It put her at the forefront of the feminist movement. Her 2002 book, The Birth of Pleasure, was described as a thrilling new paradigm, a new map of love that explored the power of love, traced its path, and how it upset the order of things. Her many interests led to her co-founding an all-female theater group, which released a theater adaptation 
of Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, where she presented many of her concepts. In her most recent book, Why Does Patriarchy Persist?, she argues that patriarchy not only maintains strict gender roles, but also prevents true pleasure in relationships. You could overthrow kings and still the tension between puritanical society and love and passion would continue. Jim Gilligan is an American psychiatrist, author, and activist, best known for his series of books entitled Violence, where he draws on a lifetime of work in and out of the American prison system to give us an original understanding of the motivations and causes of violent behavior. He's been the director of the Harvard Institute of Law and Psychiatry, the medical director of the Massachusetts Prison Mental Hospital in Bridgewater, and served as a psychiatric advisor to Martin Scorsese for the film Shutter Island. His most recent book is Holding a Mirror Up to Nature, Shame, Guilt, and Violence in Shakespeare. It documents the extraordinary, extraordinary insights Shakespeare had for understanding personal and political violence. And I'm thrilled to be a co-founder with him and Dr. Bandy Lee in a new venture at Union Theological Seminary, the Institute for the Prevention of Violence, bringing about the blessed community. So welcome, Carol and Jim. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're trying to bring about the blessed community, the nonviolent community, the ethical community, the community that enjoys love and pleasure. I mean, we've, we've got a lot on the plate there. And and uh, there's so much to talk about with you. Uh, again, so very, very, so very wonderful to see you on the Radical Meditation. Thank you once again. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So to give our audience a, a, a little bit of a background here, on, on both of you, um, let, let's start briefly, if you can, each of you. Tell us a little about your, your family background, your early childhood experiences, how you moved uh, uh, into the academic world, uh, what were some of your influence, early, early family influences. Um, as we know, Carol, you're, you're from Manhattan, the West Side, and uh, Jim is, is a little more... Uh, I had a little more exotic background uh, in the sense that he made his way from where was it Nebraska or somewhere uh, in Midwest. Yes. Not not to I'm not trying to be demeaning here, but you had quite a journey. Uh, and and so so just briefly, briefly, each of you tell us a little about those early years. What influenced you? What made you? What were the formation roots of uh, what made you what you are today? In a sense, we'll start Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. Thank you for inviting us. Um, obviously, that's that's a complicated question. Um, and you're right. I grew up on New maybe your viewers, this is familiar, uh, on the Upper West Side of New York. Um, my uh, grandparents were all immigrants. Um, my father's parents from Hungary. Uh, my mother's father from uh from the Ukraine and my mother's mother from Germany. They all came in the end of the 19th century. So my parents were first generation Americans. And um, my father went to Cornell on a region scholarship. And um, I, uh, what can I say, what influenced me? I think, two, I think of two things just to make it very brief. And one was a, a story actually when I was, um, two and a half years old, and my mother took me to this summer program that was run by Clara Thompson, the psychoanalyst at Vassar College, for parents who were interested in learning how to, about child development <clears throat> and their children. And it was a program where uh, there was a nursery school for children and seminars for the parents. And the thing is, it was run like a kibbutz, but it was for American children. Hmm. This was an arrangement that I was completely unfamiliar with, where the children slept in one house and the parents in another house. And I was the child who protested, who wouldn't go to sleep without my mother putting me to sleep. 
Mm-hmm. So I learned at the age of two the power of voice because I was the child who cried and wouldn't stop crying until my mother came. And so I learned about the power of voice to bring about change, even in these very kind of august institutions. And the second thing, and this is something I only really recognized recently, uh, was that um, I grew up during the years of the Holocaust, and it was very important, especially to my mother, that I understand my Jewish background. And so she went and, and looked at all the Hebrew schools, and she sent me to the SAJ on West 86th Street, the Society for the Advancement of Judaism. So I grew up in Reconstructionist Judaism. And when I think about my work on voice, I think that as a young child, uh, I learned the Shema, the the prayer that that Jews say every day. I learned to say this every night before I went to sleep, Mm. which is about listening. Hear, O Israel. Um, And so this... If I look at where are the deepest roots about my work on voice and listening, that's where they come from. Wow. Interesting, interesting. We'll, we'll get back to those themes. Um, and, and Jim, your, your father was a fairly prominent physician, correct? And uh, you grew up in that in, in Nebraska, and, and he had some issues as well as you can get into. And terms of perhaps his aggressiveness, his violence. And uh, uh, so what were some of the influences that you had growing up? Well, as I have written about in uh, my first uh, book on violence, uh, there was a significant degree of, of serious violence in my own family. Uh, my uh, On my father's side, the uh, uh, his family basically were refugees from the uh, uh, famine, the Irish famine of the 1840s. Mm. So they emigrated to America to escape what was basically an early form of genocide, uh, in that case against the Irish. However, um, my grandfather's brother moved to Nebraska and became a cattle rancher, a cowboy, and was as violent as most people in that world were. And, uh, uh, well, like many people of that era, was believed in corporal punishment of children. Um, But his wife, who was half Native American and uh, her mother was a Native American, and father was a French Canadian fur trapper, who uh, happened to pass my great uncle's ranch, and uh, uh, the the daughter, uh, the, the woman I'm referring to, uh, married him, had children with him, but he used corporal punishment against the children, including one son who was her favorite child. And uh, she warned him not to and said he'd regret it the rest of his life if he didn't. But he still would uh, beat this child when he wanted to discipline him. And uh, one day the the child disappeared and was discovered at the bottom of a, a well that had been dug in the backyard. And uh, when they finally discovered him, they called uh, my grandfather, who was a doctor, he was actually one of the first doctors in Nebraska who actually had gone to a medical school. Before that, they were just apprentices. So he came out to try to determine what had happened, what had killed his child. He discovered the child had died from being fed uh, a piece of apple pie that was full of rat poison, which they found the rest of in the kitchen. The uh, mother had apparently, uh, like the mother in in uh, uh, Solomon's, uh, what's her first name here? Oh, t- uh, in Tony Morrison's. Oh, Tony Morrison's book, oh, Beloved, uh, Beloved uh, had apparently killed her child to protect the child from being uh, really abused and, and degraded. Uh, uh, in Tony Morrison's novel, it was protect the child from being enslaved. 
in uh, my family is it was to protect a child from being beaten. Uh, <coughs> the uh, upshot was that the remaining, the surviving siblings of the dead child uh, were sent to my father's family, my grandfather and his father and my father's father and mother. So my father grew up with the surviving children of a in a family where one of the, the their siblings had actually been, been killed. When he uh, had children of his own, married my mother, um, he would beat her from time to time and would beat uh, beat her actually when she was pregnant with her, her first child, my older brother. So she left my father, but uh, he persuaded her to return. And as far as I know, didn't beat her after that, but he did beat my brother, seriously, uh, at a level of what is nowadays called uh, the battered child syndrome or close to it. But I felt he really created what you psychiatrists today, psychoanalysts call soul murder. He didn't murder my brother physically, but he really did destroy him. Or at least he didn't destroy him, but he really handicapped him uh, seriously from the uh, both the physical violence and the humiliation that he subjected him to. So <clears throat> I saw this as a child, tried to be a peacemaker, but of course I couldn't stop the violence as a child, nor could my mother. She would stop him from beating her children, but only after the damage had already been done. So I was, I grew up in a, in a world of violence. Um, one thing I learned from it though, was what some of the causes are. I realized as a child that my father had something that uh, I didn't have the words for then but I later discovered called an inferiority complex that even though he was a doctor and you know he was a big fish in a little pond uh, a, a major doctor in a tiny small town in rural Nebraska a town of 7,000 people and he felt inferior to the major academic researchers from the Harvard Medical School and and so forth who would give lectures at the medical meetings he would go to, so that he would try to keep up, but you know, with advancements made in medicine. But he clearly felt inferior to these uh, more eminent physicians from around the country. And it was clear to me that the reason he was, well, at least one reason, he was so violent toward my brothers uh, was because of his feelings of inferiority. And the only people he felt superior to were children, his own children. Hmm. I didn't, you know, put that together at the time with work I later did when I became a psychiatrist and was introduced to uh, something I'd never heard of before called prison psychiatry. But uh, in my psychiatric training at the Harvard Medical School, I, uh, was exposed to the opportunity, I was given the opportunity to work with violent criminals in the Massachusetts prison system. And I discovered they had the same psychological predispositions my father had had, that they also had committed their acts of violence because they felt inferior. And it was only by dominating other people, making them afraid and humiliating them that they could uh, find some way to restore uh, or compensate for their own feelings of inferiority. So I felt I learned from growing up with a violent father and uh, previous family violence, how to understand the violent criminals I was seeing in the prisons of Massachusetts and the prison mental hospital there. So. My career took off from there, but I've devoted my career as a psychiatrist to attempts to learn about the causes and uh, prevention of violence. But that's where, that's where it all started. What a story. So that was you were viewing and listening to while Carol was being taken to this kibbutz type environment and, and listening 
and finding a moral voice there. Um, so Carol, this moral voice, as you say, also found uh, itself in your academic studies, right? Um, you first went into uh, English literature, correct? And then got a degree in clinical psychology. Um, so, so again, how do those academic, those early academic uh, years influence that voice as it was developing, as you were finding your, your own true voice? <laughs> Well, you know, I, you're right, Jim. I did, uh, as an undergraduate at Swarthmore, um, I studied English literature. I was an English major and also um, uh, studied history. And so my understanding of the human world was very, very shaped by literature, you know, by the I mean, great artists and the great novelists and playwrights, Shakespeare and Virginia Woolf and Tolstoy and, you know, you name it. Uh, and also by history. And so um, that's what I was interested in. And then um, I did my graduate work, as you said, in psychology, in clinical psychology. I got my PhD in social psychology. Um, and I had the good fortune as a, after I had my degree and we had three children and I was looking to work part time. And I was very fortunate because uh, I had the opportunity to teach with Eric Erickson at Harvard and uh, his work on identity. I mean, there you could see he had the temperament of an artist and an interest in culture. I mean, his book was called Childhood and Society. And um, that really drew me back into psychology. And then I had the chance to work with Lawrence Kohlberg to teach with him. Um, again, I, I as it was a postdoc at that point. And I thought what uh, Kohlberg did in his work was he said that after the Holocaust, the social sciences could no longer adopt a stance of value neutrality, that your values are relative to your culture because we saw what happened in Germany. So he brought the study of morality back into the center of psychology. So this was very inspiring to me, these two really brilliant men. Um, and I also learned by the opportunity, this was at Harvard, to see them up close and to realize how connected their work was to their own life story. Hmm. And Eric Erickson was a man who didn't know who his real father was and who named himself. I mean, he had grown up as Eric Humberger because his mother wow. uh, had conceived him, as we say, out of wedlock uh, with a G Danish man, but married this, her German pediatrician, Humberger. So Eric is someone who named himself and Kohlberg had a big dilemma when he was a little child because his parents divorced. And his father, who was very wealthy, had said to his mother that unless he could have custody of Larry, uh, Larry would lose his inheritance from his father. So I saw how their work was connected to their lives. And you could think about, I then, for reasons I won't even go into, I was interested in how do people deal with conflict and choice in their lives? That's what I was studying. Mm -hmm. Like when people come to a place where the roads diverge and you have to ask, which way will I go? Who is the I in that statement? I mean, who is the I? And do people bring moral language? Do they ask, you know, what should I do? Or what's the right thing to do? So that's what was interesting to me as a student of literature, I would say. Um, and by a chance of history, really an accident of history, I ended up interviewing women. And um, how was that an accident of history? Tell us. Well, because I was looking for people who had to make a decision, a real decision, not a hypothetical decision. What if you found yourself in a lifeboat or, you know, the trolley problem, but <clears throat> who were actually facing a decision. And I was teaching at Harvard uh, at that time. And it was the time of the Vietnam War draft. Late 60s. We're talking about the late 60s. No, we're talking about the early 70s. The early 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Okay. And so I thought, great, I will interview Harvard students uh, when they're seniors and actually facing the draft. And would they, in fact, because I was teaching as a teaching assistant in Larry Kohlberg's course on moral and political choice. This was in the 70s after Kent State when moral issues were 
at the forefront of what was being discussed in the university. So I thought, I'll wait till these students are seniors and facing the draft and they'll see what they'll do. Are they going to go and fight a war that most of them considered unjust or would they go to jail or to Canada? I mean, that's what interested me and how would they think about the decision? What was the sense of identity and did they bring moral language? What was the moral problem? And then in 73, the year those students would have been seniors, President Nixon ended the draft. So that was the end of my study. But what happened in 73 is the Supreme Court decides in Roe v. Wade that women have a legitimate voice in making decisions about whether to continue or abort a pregnancy. So I thought, oh, here's another situation where people come to a public place and have to make a decision where the roads diverge. I mean, you can either have an abortion or have a baby. You can't do both. And uh, so with Mary Belenke, who was my graduate student at the time, and also a friend and a neighbor, we began interviewing women all over Boston from street front clinics in the South End to preterm to university health services, women who were in the first three months of a confirmed pregnancy and thinking about would they continue the pregnancy or would they have an abortion? And that was the opening to In a Different Voice because I listened to the way uh, these women were thinking. I wasn't presenting the moral problem to them. The whole discussion then as now was right to life versus right to choice. But we asked the question, how did you get pregnant? And how have you been thinking about it so far? What alternatives are you considering? How do you think about each? And we were listening for moral language, for the word should or good or right or wrong. And if they didn't, if they never used it at the end, we would say, is, is there a right thing to do in this situation, right for you or just anyone? And I heard a way of talking about the dilemma that was completely different from the right to life versus right to choice and started from a different premise that this was not a battle of rights between a mother and a fetus, a separate rights holders. This was a problem of relationship which is, was it responsible or irresponsible to continue a pregnancy and give birth to a child when you felt you couldn't take care of the child or when you couldn't even take care of yourself? Yep. Or I had a woman who was a Catholic and she had scoliosis of the spine and she had a two-year-old and she got pregnant again. And her doctor said, if you have a second pregnancy this close, you're going to be bedridden. And her husband was a roofer and out of work. And I remember her saying, God can punish, but God can forgive because her Catholic priest said it was a sin to have an abortion, but the Supreme Court said it was her decision. And there her. So we I definitely need to have that a conversation decision. that you're talking about today, bring that narrative uh, into focus again. You want to know something really interesting, and I'm going to talk about this actually at a conference at the end of the month. The central two chapters of my book, In a Different Voice which has been widely discussed, I mean, from all possible points of view, are about the abortion decision study. That was the study that prompted me to write the book. It was the, only, it was the focus of my 1977 article, In a Different Voice, Women's Conceptions of Self and Morality. It's never talked about. You can Google In a Different Voice and the abortion decision study, and the only name that comes up is mine. Hmm. And I think that's really very interesting, and that it would be a whole separate program. Yeah, conversation. I say it needs desperately to be to be brought to the front again. Um, so, with Colbert, Mr. Oh. As you put it, Mr. Morality and Mr. Identity, you right. start with them, and um, yeah. and and then Jim. I, I've got to ask you, where did you guys meet? Was it in a class or? Oh yeah, well, I was a graduate <coughs> student, and Jim was between college and he wasn't sure what he was going to do, but he was working for David Reisman and he was assisting. Psychologist at Harvard. This, at Harvard. Was yeah. this was all at Harvard. So he was kind of assisting the, the faculty who were teaching a seminar that I was taking as a graduate student. And we met in that seminar. There we go. And so then Jim, and then you took off for a year to uh, Jim, right? To study ancient Greek, uh, at Columbia. That, that was, was before, that was before then. That was before. Okay. That was you were just what was that in your head at that point? Uh well, that, actually I took a leave of absence for a year from Harvard. Right. Basically to recover from a 
serious automobile accident that I had been a passenger in. Oh. There was two, two friends of mine, including my best friend at the time, were killed. And I was nearly killed. So uh, I, I realized I just had to take a year off to kind of recover myself. So I spent a year uh, in New York. I rented a desk in the stacks of the Nicholas Murray Butler Library at Columbia and decided I wanted to study the ancient Greek classics and the Bible uh, mm -hmm. to begin with as just a way to kind of recover my sense of humanity as I felt what had happened to us was so, so horrible. Um, so yeah, I, I started, I taught myself Greek because I got so interested in being able to really understand the Iliad and the tragedies and the philosophers and so on. So that, that happened before I then returned to Harvard, where I then, um, as Carl said, I was a research assistant for David Reisman. And in that capacity, I was uh, working with the uh, teaching staff um, of the seminar that she was taking. And uh, we looked at each other across the room and decided that <laughs> yeah, we were right. the only two people that either of us was interested in there. And uh, things took off from there and have been going ever since. Going ever since. Very sorry. And, you know, I, I need to say this, too. I was going to put it in the opening in some way. But um, you've been through all kinds of things. And you've been through the, the, the academic wars and political wars. But you are such nice people. I mean, I think it's very important to bring that out and point the, that out. It doesn't happen that often, as you all know. Uh, uh, as, as you reach the highest levels of academia, but but let's 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 put you and let's put you in prison now, Jim. You are um, you are listening to some of the most violent inmates uh, that the culture has produced. You're doing your residency um, there, and what do you learn? At that point, what is the moral voice? The choices, as Carol was saying, people making these incredible choices. What were you, as you were listening to these people, learning from them? Because I think that's an, also very important to point out. You were, they were your students in a sense in understanding uh, what causes violence and, and choices that they made. So how did, how did that all happen? Well, I think my own, Biography is a perfect example of the power of the unconscious, which, of course, psychiatrists have been emphasizing ever since Freud uh, and William James. Um, I had no idea that I was going to be interested in studying violence. My goal was to become a psychoanalyst and uh, work with people more or less like myself, you know, middle class, you know, educated, reasonably prosperous people struggling with the conflicts in their own lives and psyches. I had no interest in working with anybody violent, but uh, uh, by the time I was doing my psychiatric residency at Harvard, uh, Carol and I already had uh, three children and the teaching hospital at Harvard wasn't paying me enough to pay our bills. So I found I could only supplement my salary by spending a day a week working in one of the Massachusetts prisons to provide mental health services for prisoners there. I had no interest in it. I thought people who got sent to prison were untreatable. I thought they would have no interest in exploring their own psyches or trying to understand why they had done what they had done. Uh, so I thought it would be an exercise in futility, but it would bring in money enough to pay the rent and buy the groceries. So I went in and then discovered to my surprise that everything I thought I knew was wrong, or at best a half truth. And uh, I realized from the beginning that I found this the most, first of all, emotionally moving experience I had had in psychiatry because it turned out these men had been themselves the victims of the, well, a degree of child abuse that I didn't realize even existed in our society. 
The most violent among them were the survivors of their own attempted murder at the hands of uh, a parent usually, or of the actual murders of the closest members of their families, their father or mother or sibling or whatever. I also found it was the most uh, socially important subject to which I could devote my training as a psychiatrist. So I really became hooked on uh, using prisons as, so to speak, a kind of social psychological laboratory in which to investigate the causes and prevention of violence. Uh, it wasn't until years later that I realized that, of course, I was going to be studying violence given my childhood history of exposure to violence. I, by the way, I was not beaten by my father because I, I, I always thought the reason was because he thought I was my mother's favorite child, which was the story of the child who was killed by his by his aunt. Um, so I wasn't beaten, but I witnessed this and I was appalled and horrified. I mean, I had no idea I was going to devote my life to trying to solve the problem of violence. Yeah. Uh, so that was how, you know, I kind of stumbled into this, you know, semi-conscious of why I really found it so compelling to uh, and irresistible to study people that I'd say almost all of my uh, compares, my classmates in psychiatry and my teachers, almost none of them had any interest in going any nearer a violent person than they could avoid, which was exactly my orientation before I actually got introduced uh, to people who actually had been uh, actually even much more seriously violent than even my father was. And, and the core of their experience had been shame, humiliation, and disrespect. And as you put it, um, the fear, the ultimate fear being the disintegration of the self. Could you go into that and, and, and losing oneself? Uh, and, and perhaps we can even pivot a little bit to Carol's work, recent work on, on patriarchy. And what does that mean? How, if in fact that that has some tie in. Well, I think I think Carol and I, my, my work and Carol's are totally complementary. I was going to say to each other. I yeah. mean, I think we both have emphasized the uh, the destructive effects of what you can variously call patriarchy or male supremacy or sexism or whatever word you want to use to, to describe it. They all mean the same thing. Uh, it's clear that males in our society and most other societies on this earth are raised to believe that males are just born. They have to be made. Uh, and one, one way they are made is they have to live up to the sort of male sexual stereotype that men throughout the world tend to be raised with, which is, you know, the, the worst failing is to be a sissy or a wimp or a coward. And the way that you can produce, can prove that you're really a man is by showing that you have the courage to be violent under many well-specified circumstances, whether it's fighting in war or simply, uh, uh, standing up to bullies in the schoolyard. I mean, we're, we're taught this from childhood on. Um, I, I would see male prisoners who were taught by their parents if they were came home crying from being bullied, were told by the parents yeah. that uh, the parents themselves would beat them up unless they went back and beat up the bully. So in other words, this is what males are taught. Yeah. That's, that's one reason among many others, because violence is multi-determined. There are many causes. But that's certainly one social and psychological cause for why most of the violence in this world, whether we're talking about homicide, suicide, war, capital punishment, or it, terrorism, any of the other main forms of violence, are predominantly committed by males, not, not females. This is the role that males are taught. They have to uh, act according to in order to prove that they really are men, not boys or women or 
panaceas or all the other, you know, uh, denigrating terms that uh, they're afraid they would be accused of. But, but not all men, not all men and so on. And it's a, it's a gender is a spectrum uh, in a sense. Yeah. And, 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 and Carol, you, of course, in your recent book here, Why Does Patriarchy Persist, get into people like Trump and um, focus on the real, the enormous insecurity that they really have, their inability to be, to face who they really are, because ultimately it, it, it's just too, it's just too um, complicated. It's just too hurtful to do that. Is that correct? And if you're right. We were, I, my, my co-author, Naomi Snyder, right, right. Um, she was my student and we be co-authored the book. She was a human rights lawyer who has now become a psychoanalyst. Right. Um, and we were really interested. I mean, the election of Trump uh, was a shock to us that such a, um, you know, explicitly patriarchal, misogynistic, racist, I mean, overtly man, I mean, yeah. you know, the man who spoke about grabbing women by the genitals could be elected president with 53% of white women voting for him. I mean, it was just astounding to us. Yeah. Yeah. The, what, the majority of men, of white men voting for him. I have to say, you know, that 91% of black women voted for Hillary in 2016 and 95%, I think it is, voted for Biden in 2020. So we have a complicated, we don't have a simple woman-man split here at all. It's really and, and Carol, what does that say about the women's movement as well? Well, listen, the, the, what it says about the women's movement is it couldn't be more important. Yes. I mean, I mean, it couldn't be more important because, I mean, it would be, you know, like you would have to ask if you had a majority of black people voting for a racist president, you'd have to say uh, you need a civil rights movement. And if you have a majority of white women voting for an overtly misogynistic uh, man, racist and everything else, you have to say, uh, we need a women's movement. And what's more, I mean, I define feminism as the move, the great historical movement to free democracy from patriarchy. So it's in the interest of both women and men. And I think women and men both need a feminist movement, uh, which is a movement that is devoted to freeing everybody across the gender spectrum from uh, what patriarchy does and what patriarchy does. I mean, that's the, the purpose of Naomi in my book is to say patriarchy persists not simply because people with power don't like to give up their power, that we know, but also because it serves a psychological function, which is by forcing a sacrifice of relationship. And I mean, this is not a hidden thing. I mean, just read the Bible, read about Abraham and Isaac that the way you prove your devotion to God is by your willingness to sacrifice your son. Mm. <clears throat> it forces a sacrifice of relationship. And ironically, what that does is, I mean, as we all know, we're never so vulnerable as when we open ourselves to relationship because we are vulnerable to loss. So patriarchy, ironically, is a protecting protection against the vulnerability of loving that is, that is being vulnerable to loss. So that was the discovery of our book. And that's true for everybody across the gender spectrum. So but here, both. yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry. But, but, you know, here we have, I think yesterday's Times, a couple of days ago, New York PD uh, police department leader and DA clash over jail. Here we have a new African-American mayor with a black African-American female uh, police commissioner who is calling for, let's see, let me do a quote here, Commissioner Sewell, um, ba -ba -ba -bum, very concerned about the implications of your safety as police officers and safety of the public and justice for the victims. Um, the, the DA, who's also African American, um, uh, said a 10, 10 page memo instructing prosecutors to avoid seeking jail or prison time for all but the most serious crimes and to cease charging a number of lower level crimes. So here you have now, you know, sort of an Alice in Wonderland sort of world here where you have uh, a black mayor with a black female um, 
police commissioner calling for more hardline punitive measures that will affect more of the poor uh, people of color. What do you think is going on in her mind? I guess I'll start with Carol in terms of what is she doing there? Does she have to prove herself in, in front of the guys there, the old boys network that she's tough enough and, and so on? Or what do you think is going on there? First of all, I have no idea what's going on in her mind. I wouldn't presume to say. I okay. would be very interested. I mean, I think it would be she'd be a fascinating person. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She obviously has a reason for what she's doing. And I'm sure that in her mind, it seems like a very good reason. The other thing I just simply would say is um, that, I mean, I, I really think it's very simplistic. To, I mean, you can, not, you can say, which is true. I think it's 93 or 95 percent of black women voted for Biden in 2020, which is the largest percentage of every group, any group, more than black men, more than white women, certainly more than white men. But there were, you know, there were 9% who didn't. So this idea that all black women vote the same or all white women vote the same or all men are the same, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a sloppy way to think, I think. Yeah, I, I didn't quite, it didn't come across. I'm not trying to, I, I hear what you're saying, but one would also expect a certain sensitivity uh, to those. We've what have we learned over the last twenty? Well, then, years? then you say, how come uh, the majority of white women in Texas voted for the governor and for sure. Ted Cruz, who supported the ban on abortion? After absolutely, Trump? absolutely. And absolutely. How, how come men vote for policies uh, like through the gun laws, and, and more men than anybody are killed by guns? Okay, so, well taken. The reason he could, I think. I'll make a little plea for psychology. The reason you have, need psychology is to explain these things, which logically make no sense. I mean, okay. there's a psychological logic, but it's not the same as a what kind of a logical logic, a deductive yeah. logic. Okay. There's a there's a logic here, and I think for that reason, uh, this police commissioner would be an extremely interesting person to understand. I mean, right. I would be very interested to interview the white women who voted for Trump. I mean, I really wonder right. what led them to believe that this man uh, would be the best president. Agreed. Agreed. You know, and, and this hour has gone so fast. In the few minutes we have left, Jim, let, talk a little about your new book on Shakespeare. Yeah. Talk about... It's a fabulous book. It's a fabulous book, who's, and he's been dubbed uh, as the greatest psychologist of, of, of our of history. So what did you learn from, you know, and it, it, it seems like things are coming full circle here now. You're, you're both going back to literature, uh, Shakespeare, the Bible, and, you're in, 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 and it's a fabulous book. Tell us about uh, what, you've, what you've been doing in that book. Well, the background to it is, you know, I was trained as a psychiatrist, and psychiatrists consider of all the various forms of uh, vi lethal violence, they consider suicide uh, uh, appropriate for a psychiatrist to study. But by and large, mainstream psychiatry has now regarded homicide as an equally legitimate and central subject for a psychiatrist to study. When people commit murder, the psychiatrist, the, the main, the psychiatric mental health system has primarily just delegated dealing with them to the criminal justice system where they get sent to prison and Basically, nobody pays much attention to them after that. We just want to lock them up and keep them away. I realized when I started working with violent prisoners that I was not going to get much help from most of the psychiatric literature because psychiatrists hadn't studied murder mm -hmm. as a legitimate psychiatric subject, with a few honorable exceptions. What I did learn was that how I'd learned about violence was by studying the Greek tragedies, uh, the, the Bible, and in, in terms of modern literature and culture, the works of Shakespeare. Uh, I'd studied Shakespeare in college. I loved Shakespeare. Uh, he was actually one of Carol's also main intellectual influences. <laughs> what I discovered was when I saw one person after another in the prisons who had committed a murder and sometimes followed it by suicide uh, at that time or later, um, I realized that 
the person who explained this most clearly was Shakespeare. For example, when I saw a prosperous man, a, a successful person in his community, uh, in one of the largest cities in Massachusetts, you know, uh, you know, morally upstanding, no criminal history, who had murdered his wife and then felt so guilty, uh, he made a serious suicide attempt, uh, driving his car into a reservoir to drown himself. And I couldn't make sense of him until suddenly I realized I had just met Othello, the Shakespearean tragic protagonist who killed his wife when he felt she no longer loved him and who then felt so guilty about it that mm. he committed suicide. Mm. So I saw the importance of both shame and guilt. He felt shamed when he felt she had rejected him uh, sexually and romantically. And he felt guilt when he realized he had killed somebody who he actually also loved. So that taught me that if, if I wanted to find the best psychologist from whom to learn about violence, I had to read Shakespeare. And I discovered one play after another. The violent people I saw in the prisons walked right out of his plays. I saw the equivalent of Richard III, of, of uh, Macbeth, Timon of Athens, uh, Hamlet, uh, the, the characters in King Lear, and on and on. They all came out of Shakespeare. And and Jim and, and Kevin, unfortunately we have run out of time, so we're going to have to go out and get this book. It just got published. Um, it got published. It just got published with you and David Richards, right? Yes. And and uh, we'll pick up the. Uh, we, I have your book on patriarchy as well. So thank you so very much, Carol uh, and Jim, for just such an enlightening, wonderful hour. Uh, there's so much more to cover, and I hope we'll do this again real soon. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much for your questions. They were great. Thank, Thank you very much, Jim. You were great, and you're a beacon of love and and uh, and and friendship and uh, companionship, and we just love you both very, very much. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you so much, you Jim. Too. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Take care in person. And thank you so very, very much for watching us here on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vrenos. We'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. Marry me a little, love be just enough. Cry but not too often, play but not too rough. Keep a tender distance so we'll both be free. That's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, marry me a little, do it with a will. Make a few demands I'm able to fulfill. Want me more than others, not exclusively. That's the way it ought to be. I'm ready. I can be your right arm We'll go through a fight or two No harm, no harm We'll look not too deep We'll go not too far We won't have to give up a thing We'll stay who we are, right? Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready now Someone marry me a little, love me just enough Warm and free and easy, just the simple stuff Keep a tender distance so we'll both be free, that's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, marry me a little, body, heart and soul, passionate as hell, but always in control. Want 
happy first and foremost. Keep me company. That's the way it ought to be. I'm ready. I'm ready now. Oh, how gently we'll talk. Oh, how softly we'll tread all the stings, the ugly things we'll keep unsaid. We'll build a cocoon of love and respect. You promise whatever you like, I'll never collect.